While many of the words in Scripture offer comfort and encouragement, its overarching message does not pull any punches. It doesn't pull any punches when it comes to saying hard things. For those who are unwilling to confess that they are a sinner, for those who are unwilling to repent of their ungodly ways, for those who have not staked their eternal state in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and Christ alone, the hope that the Christian gospel affords cannot be rightly claimed. There was a 19th century Methodist preacher by the name of Peter Cartwright. He was once invited to preach where the then president of the United States, Andrew Jackson, would be present. Before the service, those who were coordinating things went up to him and, and, and warned him not to say anything that was out of line. When Cartwright got up to preach, he said, I understand that Andrew Jackson is here. I have been requested to be guarded in my remarks. Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he doesn't repent. The congregation was shocked. But afterward, the president shook Cartwright's hand and said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could whip the world. We could say that the 19th century preacher, Peter Cartwright, was cut from the same cloth as was John the Baptist. While it garnered Cartwright praise from the president, for John the Baptist, the very same message meant imprisonment and eventually the loss of his head at Herod's command. Now know this, the goal in preaching is not to offend. Rather, the goal in preaching is to make Christ known. But I would say this to you this morning. If you have never heard Christ made known and in your own standing not been offended by the gospel, that you are a sinner and in need of saving, a salvation that is offered freely by none other than God himself through Jesus, that if in that offense of being told you aren't perfect and indeed you offer nothing to God. If that has not eventually led your eyes to be downcast and caused your knees to bend, I would warn you to take stock of your soul this morning. You see, no one likes being told they need to change. No one likes being told that there's something about them that's offensive. And yet, when we come to see it with our own eyes, people are willing to go to great ends, great ends to, to make things right. The doctor says that your weight or your cholesterol is going to kill you, so, so you begin seeing a dietitian and start hitting the gym. Your spouse says that your marriage is over if things don't change, so you begin seeing a marriage counselor and, and work at communicating differently. The bank calls and says that unless you can make your next payment, you're going to lose your house. And so you cut up those credit cards and you get your spending under control. As much as we know that these reactions to the perils of life would be wise, they aren't always the case. Be it laziness or the love of food, the apathy that can take hold in a marriage that has become cold, the ease with which tapping your credit card offers some sense of momentary pleasure. These can all be too much to give up, even in the face of great peril. See, no one likes being told they need to change. No one likes being told that there's something about them that's offensive. To say it differently, while you and I, we, we know we aren't perfect, we aren't God, it's not something we like to be reminded of. And it's to this that the warning from Holy Scripture is that the righteous wrath of God is real. And if we're honest, you and I do not consider it with the weightiness with which God describes it. You see, the requirement to avoid God's wrath is that we believe God's word and we repent. But if we're honest, you and I, we are not as repentant of a people as we believe ourselves to be. And while speaking about wrath and our lack of true repentance isn't all that comfortable of a fit at first, as we'll see embedded in these two things is really good news. In fact, any declaration of salvation or, the, or hope of heaven that is void of either wrath and or repentance is actually no offer of hope at all. It's false good. It's, it's fool's gold. In our time together this morning, we're going to be spending our time in Luke chapter 3. So if you have a Bible, I'm going to invite you to open to that. Uh, I've got Horst and Brian are going to stand up. They've got some Bibles here. So if you don't have a Bible, just put your hand up and they will happily hand you one. A couple over there. So three on this side and maybe someone over here. Right there, perfect. You're going to open up to Luke chapter 3. If you're using one of the Bibles that we hand out as you come in, you can look on page 584, page 584 
We're going to be in Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, uh, if you take one on your way in or you were just given one, that's yours. That's our gift to you. And we hope it becomes a treasured possession of yours. This morning's passage is one that fast forwards about 18 years from, from when we last encountered Jesus as a boy in the temple. Jesus is now about 30 years old, but as you'll see in just a minute when we read, he isn't even named in this section. And yet Jesus is actually the focal point. Kind of like one of those 3D pictures. You know when you look at it and it's all, it's all blurry, you can't see anything. But then when you have the right focus, all of a sudden the picture emerges. And in this passage, you and I are intended to see that God is merciful towards those who believe his word and repent. Repentance that Jesus makes possible. The warning from Holy Scripture is that the righteous wrath of God is real. And if we are honest, you and I do not consider it with the weightiness that God himself describes it. The requirement to avoid God's wrath is that we believe God's word and repent. But if we're honest, you and I are not as repentant of a people as we believe ourselves to be. While speaking about Wrath and our lack of true repentance isn't all that comfortable of a fit at first, as we'll see embedded in these two things. It's actually really, really good news. With that said, if, you, if you're able to stand with me, I'd invite you to do so for the reading of God's word this morning. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. Hear the word of the Lord. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, while Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Eturia and Trachonitis, and Licentius, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, God's word came to John, the son of Zebedee, in the wilderness. He went into all the vicinity of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley will be filled, every mountain and hill will be made low, the crooked will become straight, the rough way smooth, and everyone will see the salvation of God. He then said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't start saying to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The ax is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What then should we do? The crowds were asking him. He replied, the one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. And the one who has food must do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He told them, Don't collect any more than what you have been authorized to. Some soldiers also questioned him, What should we do? He said to them, Don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. Now the people were waiting expectantly, and all of them were questioning in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I am is coming. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. Then along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed good news to the people. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the evil things he had done, Herod added this to everything else and locked up John in prison. So the word of the Lord, you may be seated as I pray for us. Father in heaven, by a work of your spirit this morning, Use this time in your word to bring about fruit in our lives, which is consistent with repentance. Where our hearts are hard toward you, soften them. And may your kingdom come and may your will be done in us as individuals and in this church as a whole, just as it is done in heaven. With nothing but Christ to our credit, we ask this of you now. Amen. <clears throat> 
While all of the Gospels are a historical account of Jesus, Luke stands out in a way, in the way that it's constructed. It's constructed with more dates and times and names and places specifically referenced. More so than, than all of the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. Because we know that, that Luke's aim in writing is intended to give us certainty concerning the things we have believed about Jesus or provide a context for belief for those who have not yet believed and are curious. For us today, we might think that all of these uh, extra names and dates are unnecessary or maybe Luke's a bit wordy, but if you were a part of the original audience, the details that Luke provides would go a long way in authenticating his account. But this is not to mistake Luke's gospel for a neutral historical document. No, it's intended to convey in whom we have life and how we are to live in light of that new life. And it was in these days that one named John, on whom the Spirit of God was with from the time that he was in the womb, began proclaiming a message from God. You see, prior to Christ's coming and and the giving of his word, which, by the way, if you have a Bible in your hands, you are holding God's word. God spoke to his people through prophets. These prophets were ordinary people to whom the scripture says the word of the Lord would come. They didn't come bringing some culturally relevant message or winsome saying that could fit on a bumper sticker. They weren't serving up chicken soup for the soul. They weren't trying to win friends and influence people. The words they brought came from God and carried the consequence that should those words not be heeded, should they not be obeyed, destruction would follow. If you can remember back to our time in in Luke 1, right at the beginning, John's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, were righteous in God's sight. They were ones who believed God's word and lived in accordance to it. But they felt the societal shame of being childless. And yet the the ones who would have been thought of as as less than socially, lacking culturally, this barren old woman and a man who could not conceive were given a gift by God. A son whose name would be John. A son that, that God said would be filled with the Holy Spirit who would come before the King of Kings with a message from God that would turn the hearts of those who had been walking in disobedience back to God. A message that would see them begin to walk in righteousness. The angel which uh, revealed what John's purpose would be said that he would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now fast forward 30 years and this is where we find ourselves this morning. In Matthew's gospel, we're given a bit more of a description of, of John and it says this, John's clothes were made of camel's hair. And he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. You see, the the people of God had strayed from obedience to God's word. The pressures from the world around them and the politics which can so easily pollute their own leaders had resulted in the acceptance of, of lukewarm adherence to God's word at best. Weak leaders who cut corners and sought their own acclaim. The same leaders who would one day concoct a plan and rally the crowds to yell, crucify him, crucify him. And John, the last of the Old Testament prophets, has a kind of wild danger about him. And it's attractive to, the, it's attractive to those who have been thirsting for God's word, but who have been robbed of it by their leaders. Leaders who found their, their solace in their religious structures and their own position. And where we find John isn't where you would expect if you wanted to draw a crowd. He's not set up in that place that you can see from the highway. He's not in a three-piece suit. He's not calling people to meet in an air-conditioned space. He's he's most certainly not avoiding saying all those hard things. Uh, Traditions and banquets are not his bag. Consoling people who are comfortable in their sins so that he might pad his stats and claim the most disciples was not his aim. No, look back at verse 4. He was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight, the rough way smooth, and everyone will see the salvation of God. Why was he doing this? Why was he saying, prepare the royal road? Why was he one wanting everyone to see the salvation of God? Because Because our time is much shorter than we think it is. And God's wrath was coming. And here's the surprise. It was coming in Jesus. Verse 9, the axe is already at the root of the tree. 
This might sound odd to your hearing as we often speak of Jesus as the Prince of Peace, and we are right to speak of him in this way. This is what the the scripture speaks of him as such. But note, the peace that Christ brings is not the kind of peace we see painted on signs at an anti-war protest or or the fingers portrayed by shaggy haired hippie wannabes at concerts. That kind of peace, while while pleasurable, is only temporal. No, the peace that Jesus would bring would be an everlasting peace between you and I, who without the righteousness of Christ credited to our account, are by very nature enemies of God. And the warning of John to unrepentant people who claimed God's favor was to repent because God's wrath was real and it would be dished out by the Prince of Peace. You see, the warning from Holy Scripture is that the righteous wrath of God is real. And if we're honest, you and I do not consider it with the weightiness that God himself describes it. If you look down to verse 15 of our passage, it makes this clear. Now, the people were waiting expectantly, and all of them were questioning in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I am is coming. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff, he will burn with fire that never goes out. I don't know about you, but I too often fail to consider the eternality of God's righteous wrath upon unrepentant sinners. What horrors and grief awaits those who reject Christ? We see in verse 17, a winnowing shovel, or maybe in your translation, a winnowing fork, uh, is something similar that we see is similar to like a pitchfork. It was used to separate the the stuff that was good, the stuff that you wanted, and in this case, the wheat, from the useless stuff, the stuff that would be burned, in this case, the chaff. Uh, the worker would throw it up in the air and on the, end of the, on the end of the fork and the grain would fall and the chaff would be swept, by the, swept away by the wind for, for burning. Well, this is a general word of warning that is true for all people in all places and all times. Another image is used to warn those who think too little of God's wrath and instead find their righteousness in their position. Look back to verse 7 with me. He then said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Two times in our passage this morning, the the term the crowds is used here in verse 7 and again in verse 10. But they aren't actually referring to the same group of people. While we're given a hint that there are two different crowds being referenced in Luke, Matthew's gospel actually helps to clearly define who these two groups are. Matthew's gospel tells us that the first group to whom the title of vipers is given references the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were the religious leaders of of two distinct groups among the Jewish people. And they were also ones who had come to find their righteousness in their position. On the surface, they would do the right thing, sort of. But in their heart, which no man can hide from God, they were riddled with pride and self-interest and had rejected God's word. You see, we all know that we can do the right thing without actually having the right heart. And then, in a sense, we're not really doing the right thing. You understand what I mean when I say that? Later in Luke's gospel, Luke recounts a parable that Jesus told related to this. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I tell you, that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. To these people, look back to verse 8. John said, And don't start saying to yourselves that we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. 
You see, the warning from Holy Scripture is that the righteous wrath of God is real. And if we're honest, you and I do not consider it with the weightiness that God himself describes it. Now, none of us here are Pharisees or Sadducees. (laughs) None of us link our salvation to our claim as sons or daughters of Abraham. Very few of us in this church are, are Jewish by descent. But it's quite likely that you have in the past, as have I, or maybe even currently do, think of yourself as one whom God will admit who God will admit or show his favor upon even just a little bit because of something you've done, because maybe you think you're a good person. No, you're not perfect, and you know that, but you're not as bad as the other guy. But for you, apart from Christ, know this, the wrath of God is coming. And in hearing this, maybe you, like the people who heard John's warning, have the same question in mind. Look back to verse 10. What then should we do? What should we do? His answer clearly states that we are to have lives which reflect a true belief in God's word, a kind of life that displays a heart that has been changed, one that doesn't seek our glory but God's. See, the requirement to avoid God's wrath is that we believe God's word and repent. But if we're honest, you and I are not as repentant of a people as we believe ourselves to be. Repentance is something really specific, but it it often gets confused with confession. But they're two very different things, often related, but they're different. Repentance literally means to turn away from. So think of it as though you're walking down a road, and to repent would mean stopping and walking the opposite direction. Confession is declaring something to be true. As these terms are used in the Bible and even in our own culture, both repentance and confession usually are related to something wrong, something like sin. So as it relates to sin, confession is admitting that whatever it is you have done is a sin and in opposition to how God has called you to be a reflection of his holiness. Repentance is the act of changing one's behavior to display how God has called you to be a reflection of his holiness. And while the two should go together, we can convince ourselves that maybe they don't always need to. For example, we can confess that something is wrong and yet continue to do it, uh, admitting that you know that it's wrong to hate a person, but harboring bitterness in your heart toward them. Confession without repentance. We can also stop doing something wrong or start doing something right without actually confessing that what we were previously doing or not doing was wrong. That's repentance without confession. Maybe it's giving to those in need without ever having confessed that uh, our hearts were full of greed and that was sinful. As Christians, confession and repentance are to be regular parts of our daily walk. While there are theological reasons for the departure from the way that the The Catholic Church has historically practiced confession, and I I think it's right that we've departed from that. Protestant churches have by and large abandoned confession, and in my opinion, have been weakened as a result. Our sins have become private because we, by and large, live private lives and private faiths that go with it. But remember, as, as God calls me to live in Christ, he has called me to live that out in relationship with you. And as God calls you to be in Christ, he's called you to live in relationship with me. We confess our sins not just to God, but to one another. This is the way that God has structured things so that true repentance, a turning, can actually take place. On our own, you and I are very weak. and We're not as repentant as we believe ourselves to be. And for people who profess to know God, both must be present and are the fruit that comes from believing God's word. A rejection of either one of these should rightly cause us to consider whether or not we are actually a part of God's family. And implicit in our passage, confession is present. Because the people are asking, what should we do? We know that we're wrong. We know that we're sinners. How do we repent? See, the requirement to avoid God's wrath is that we believe God's word and repent. But if you and I are honest, we are not nearly as repentant to people as we believe ourselves to be. You see, the cost of true repentance is high. And it changes the landscape of our life. Such that everyone can see that the salvation of God is real. What should we do then, the crowds were asking him. Look back to verse 11. Verse 11. 
The one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none, and the one who has food must do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He told them, Don't collect any more than what you have been authorized. Some soldiers also questioned him, What should we do? He said to them, Don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. We'll talk in more detail about this in later weeks, but, but John's baptism wasn't a Christian baptism. We know it wasn't a Christian baptism because the work of Christ, of dying and, and being raised from the dead, going under the water and coming up out of the water, that's the, the picture that Christian baptism references. It hadn't happened yet. The people of God were still under the old covenant where their faith in God's word was credited to them as righteousness. For Jews who, who could become ceremonially unclean, a cleansing would be needed to allow them to access the temple. It was also intended for someone who wasn't Jewish, who was a Gentile, that wanted to become Jewish. Along with a few other ceremonial things, one of the things that they would do is get baptized. This was an outward sign of an inward change of heart. They feared God. They believed his word. They wanted to walk in his ways and be identified with his people. This was a public confession that apart from God, apart from confessing they needed God's grace, they were unclean. In Matthew's gospel, we read that the Pharisees refused to be baptized. Tells you something about that. When someone refuses to obey God's word. But the crowds, they came seeking the forgiveness of their sins and they were baptized and asked, what then should they do now that they've been baptized? The answer for you and I today echoes the words of Isaiah. Flatten mountains, fill valleys, straighten crooked roads, and smooth out rocky paths. Produce fruit consistent with repentance. And everyone will see that the salvation of God, which came in the person of Jesus, is real. Because the time is short. The axe is at the root of the tree. So believe God's word and turn from your sin. In very practical ways, John tells those who are asking him what this looks like and what they should do. Look back to verse 11. Give away all your excess to those who don't have enough. Don't take more than you're authorized to take. Be satisfied with what you have. Interestingly, each of the directors have economic implications, something we'll unpack in in later weeks. Jesus will later warn those who uh, who would think and follow their love of money. He would reference them specifically. But, But for you and I today, It may have to do with with how we think about our money, but it may not. Remember, repentance is turning from something which God opposes. It's going the opposite way. And the way that scripture uses this term is that it is an ongoing thing. Repentance is not a one and done kind of thing. It's an ongoing action. It's a defining marker of our lives. So it could mean, instead of harboring bitterness and avoiding that person, loving and engaging them. Could mean putting the brakes on the plan to to leave your marriage and instead seeking help to see it restored. It could mean no longer viewing Christian brothers and sisters through the lens of vaccinated or unvaccinated, but instead through the blood of Christ. It could mean confessing and turning from those secret sins that have had you shackled by shame. When a king would plan to visit a city, a messenger would be sent ahead to tell everyone he was coming. And to honor his coming, the road that approached the city would be fixed up. But what is being spoken of here through through John the Baptist in relation to Jesus coming isn't just picking up garbage and painting fresh lines on the pavement. It's a complete leveling of the landscape. I don't know if you've ever driven across the prairies before in, in Canada. But if you have, you know that there are sections that are completely flat and completely straight for as far as the eye can see. Depending how clear it is, you can see big objects coming for miles and miles and miles. Look back at verse 5 with me. Every valley will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight, and the rough way smooth, and everyone will see the salvation of God. True repentance is unmistakable because it levels the landscape. Imagine with me. Montrigal flattened, the valley through which the Ottawa River flows raised, the windy roads of St. Lazare. You'll get lost back there. They're all made straight. And wait for this one. Every pothole in Montreal filled. 
Should these things happen, we all would know that something monumental will have happened. Something big is going on. And this is what it looks like when the God of all creation is the object of your heart's affection. This is what a turning to God looks like in your life and in mine. It is monumental in scale. And anyone who knew you then and knows you now will see the evidence of God's salvation. For the people John addressed, it looked like them no longer having that blue tunic anymore, just the brown one, because they gave their blue tunic to one who didn't have one at all. It meant going to pay that tax to Caesar, that, that wicked government, and noticing that the tax collector no longer demanded more than they were authorized to take. It meant no longer being afraid of that soldier that used to shake them down because that soldier no longer demanded bribes to get out of trumped-up charges. The requirement to avoid God's wrath is that we believe God's word and repent, but if we're honest, you and I are not as repentant a people as we believe ourselves to be. And while speaking about wrath and our lack of true repentance isn't all that comfortable of a fit at first, embedded in these two things is really good news. And thanks be to God, because in our own standing, we cannot be repentant enough, nor can we do enough good. At the time that John the Baptist was preaching, we're reminded, as we were in the first chapter of Luke, that, that the people had been waiting expectantly for God's promised Messiah to come. And for the people of the day, John was unlike anyone they had ever heard, unlike anyone they had ever known. Was he the promised Messiah? John said, look to verse 16. No. No. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I am is coming. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the, with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. Then along with many other exhortations, get this, in the middle of this message of wrath, along with this, he proclaimed good news to the people. You see, in John's day, the people were waiting for God's rescuer, but John wasn't it. No, he pointed toward the coming of Christ. But here in our day, we can say with absolute certainty, with 100% confidence, that Christ has come. And the Christian hope is that one day Christ will come again. When all things will be made new, and all things will be laid bare, and all things done in secret will be exposed to the light and judged accordingly. And for some, this declaration is like the aroma of life because their hope isn't in their own works, but in the work of Christ. His perfection in the place of my imperfection. But for others, it carries the stench of death. For some, the thought of being judged by God brings about a knowledge of certain rescue. But for others, it carries the weight of uncertainness and wrath. You see, the people of God are a people that have confessed, I am a sinner and whose lives are marked by ongoing repentance, a turning from those things which are opposed to God and instead retrained on those things that bring God glory. And that is the fruit that comes from a heart that has been changed. And when we live repentant lives, we are humbling ourselves and declaring Christ's perfection as our own. And what John called the people of God to prior to Jesus' death and resurrection is actually fleshed out for you and I who live in that post-cross world in a world where the power of sin and death have been defeated through the sacrifice of Christ, his life in the place for yours. In Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter answered those who were asking pretty much the same question as the crowds were asking of John the Baptist. You, you told us that we're sinners, that, that we're separated from God. What must we do to be saved? Peter's response was, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of of your sins. If your heart has been perverted by the politics of our day or the pornography which defines our culture, if in your past you hide the shame of adultery or abortion, if in your present you manifest the deceptive gains of greed or gluttony, if you are one who is angry and argumentative, if you are one who has gobbled up the lure of death that drunkenness or addiction has offered you, if in your heart unforgiveness and bitterness has kept you shackled, if you know these things to be true of you, know this. The call is to repent and obediently place your faith in God's good word, which is for you today, right now, 
And this is where the exhortation to repentance is good news for all of us. The gospel, the good news, that's what gospel means. That God has made a way for you and me who are by very nature are children of wrath to instead be in right relationship with him. God is merciful toward those who believe his word and repent. Our time is shorter than any of us believe it to be. And as Christ has come and will come again, this is what scripture tells us. The question isn't whether or not you are a sinner, but what kind of sinner are you? One who has repented and believed God's word and will know God's favor, or one who refuses to repent and will feel God's wrath. God is merciful towards those who believe his word. Therefore, produce fruit consistent with repentance. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, your word is good. So by a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, bring about a confidence in your word, in our hearts, concerning all that we should do. Bring about repentance in our lives so that all might see the salvation of God. We ask this in the standing of Christ our Lord. Amen.